Chavre, how are you? I hope everyone is gesund, stark, and feilich, begash, misubruchnis. I hope everyone is healthy, strong, and happy physically and spiritually. <coughs> You'll have to excuse me. <coughs> My voice is not back to its full strength. Baruch Hashem. In any case, let us proceed. Be'ezat Hashem is Baruch. <coughs> this week's parsha is Parshas Turuma, which begins a whole series of parshas that talk about the construction of the Mishkan and the Aveda which took place in the Mishkan and the uh, uniform of the Koyanim, etc. And this continues primarily one way or the other through Turuma, Tetzave, Kisisa, also the Yakel and Pukude. So this is like nothing else in the Torah, that goes on and on speaking about one building, one construction, and the words that Hashem spoke, and how much space the Torah gives to discuss its details. So from this we understand that this is one of the most monumental concepts in Yiddishkeit, in Judaism. So we'll get to that briefly, but today I want to focus on one message, but which is so relevant that it will make a tremendous difference in our lives. But first we'll begin with a prayer, a verse from Tilim, which says, Which means that Hashem saves their souls from death and to sustain them during famine. So one interpretation you could say that it goes on Torah, Torah is our way of life. So this is what it means. That if you learn Torah and you go on the Torah's ways, your life will be saved, your spiritual life. And to feed them and give them life and famine, similar to what the verse says, Whoever is thirsty, you should satiate yourselves through Torah. Nothing will do it like Torah. Torah is mazain, Torah is the greatest food, and Torah will sustain us like nothing else. In this week's parsha, we talk about the construction of the Mishkan. Hashem says, make me a Mikdash and I will dwell in them. And as we all know, the Maimar Azal, it doesn't say I will dwell in it, in the house, but I will dwell in them. In other words, Hashem resting in this Mikdash, a Mikshkan, represents how God is with us. And there's a lot more to say on this. I don't want to go into everything right now. Suffice it to say, I just want to say one, one small point, which can be elaborated for weeks and weeks. Is that in general, without chassidus, we look at it like it says, The whole idea of this concept of make me a home is that really God doesn't need a home. Why is there a home? For us. Why does God want a home on this planet Earth? For us. So we should be able to relate to Him. So we should be able to go to a place where He is more revealed. So we should in general understand how God wants to be with us, we have this word, home. And just like we understand the concept of home, everybody wants a home, so God also wants a home. But not really that He wants a home. It's just in order, it's a language, so that we should be able to relate to it. But those that learn chassidus understand over here that it's not only about one mitzvah, but also the mikdash v'shachanti v'secha, make me a home, and I will dwell in it, in them, but as it's brought down in Chassidus, starting from the Alter Rebbe in chapter 36 of his Tanya, and the entire Lukut Hesichus of the Rebbe, that there's a Maimar Azal that says, Nis baruch hu, God desired to have a dwelling place down here below. So the point is, it's not that in order we should be able to relate to it. God desired, Nis baruch hu, baruch Why? That's a separate story. What's the explanation? That's another story. But the point is, it starts from him. And that's why, actually, by the way, you also want to own a home. It started from above, and then 
that's what became the normal consciousness of a person that without a home he feels incomplete. And so to God, Kaviochel wanted, desired a home. And therefore, it's not only one mitzvah. The Alter Rebbe takes this Maimar Azal, which in one medrash it says it concerning this posik, but also says it somewhere else. But still, without the Alter Rebbe in general, without Chassidus Chabad, we would have said that this Maimar Azal, that God wants a dwelling place down and below, is referring primarily to one mitzvah in the Torah. The mitzvah of making a mikdash and a mishkan comes along the Alter Rebbe and Gans Chassidus Chabad and says the whole word of Ezeh Kol Odom V'sach L'zbar Yosu Yivir Yis Kol Heilu M'salyenim S'achteinim L'yis L'yizbar Akdira B'tachteinim Everything is about this V'osu Li Mikdash V'shechanti V'seichom Not only the verses that follow in these parashas that talk about that building of Mishkan or that building of Mikdash but we're talking about everything. Shaking a lulav is part of dira b'tachtoyin, making a home for God in this world. Putting on tefillin is part of dira b'tachtoyin. Every single mitzvah of all of the 630 mitzvahs has to do with dira b'tachtoyin, etc. So uh, that's just a statement that has to be realized for those that don't learn chassidus, that the importance and the broad range of the verse of Osuli Migdosh, Vishachanti Bisoichom, in a certain sense, is not only about one mitzvah, <laughs> which if someone's going to ask someone who's not a Lubavitcher, what does the Pasuk of Osuli Migdosh Vishachanti Bisoichom mean? He's going to say it's one of the 630 mitzvahs, and it's called building a Mikdosh and a Mikdosh for Hashem. If you speak to a Chassid who learned Chassid is Chabad, and you'll ask him, what is that Pasuk? He'll say, that is the entire Torah. Everything that's in it is that Pasuk. Now, that was just an introduction. That's not really what we're going to talk about today. But just to bring out what is very interesting about what I want to speak today is, there's a Pasuk. One of the things that it speaks about in this week's parish is to make an urn. The Ark. And there were different details about the Ark. There was the Kruvim. And there was the uh, golden ark, and there was a wooden ark, and there was a crown, a zeir, zahav. But guess what? There was also there were the rings, and then there were the poles. And the pasuk says, "Vasisa bade atze shitim b'tzipisa yisam zahav." You should make those poles of wood and cover them with gold. And then it says in verse fifteen, "Betabu yisaorin yiu." Habadim, in the ring should be the poles. Lo yosuru mimenu. Those poles should always be remain in on connected to the ark. That means in their rings. And Rashi says in the words, Lo yosuru mimenu, she should never be taken away. They should remain there always. La elam, which means forever. So what's the chidush? The chidush is that you would think there's the Oren had to be moved, especially the Mishkan was very mobile. So the Oren had to be moved when they were moving and dismantled the Mishkan. So therefore you had to have poles. That's why you have the poles. So that when the Oren is moved, you carried it. The Levium carried the poles on their shoulder. And with that, they moved the Oren. So you would think that when do the poles have to be in the Oren, when there's a call that they have to move, we'll put the poles right away in the Oren. How long can it take already? And we'll move. Like, go, 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 move, move, move. We say no. This is the Chidosh. The poles have to be constantly attached to the Oren. That means they have to be ready 24-7 if they have to be moved. That's a Chidosh. You could think we could park we could park the Oren in the Kochi Kochen, make a full stop, full breaks, and we could take off the poles. Isn't the beauty of the Oren, let's say, independent of its poles? Why do we need the poles connected to the Oren at all times? So that's a question. Now, interesting to note, which I find this very fascinating, and maybe I'm wrong, that in the end, this whole parsha has three mitzvahs. One of them is connected to the 
Shulchan to the Lechem upon him. One of them is the general mitzvah of Osir in English, which is Shachanti B'Seichem. And one of the mitzvahs, Eloisa says, what it says over here about the poles, Loyosuda B'Manu. So I find that very, very extraordinary that, you know, imagine we had a Lego set. Lahavdal of Havdalah, just to make it in a very coarse manner. And you bought the Mishkan Lego set. <laughs> and there are instructions. And it comes with a thousand five hundred different pieces. And you have to follow these instructions. And there's so many instructions to put together. The Mizbeach Achitz and the Mizbeach Apimi, the Kiyar, the Menorah. There's so many instructions and so many details about every single item. But guess what? In this instruction manual, they highlighted, in the sense that they made it a commandment. Number one, they made it a commandment, make me a mishkan. Then there was another commandment concerning the lechem upon the shulchan, whatever, we're not discussing here today. And then another one, that the poles should never be disattached from the urn. Wow. I mean, of course, there's a technical answer why that is a Mrs. Lysa, because that was written in such a way and spoken in such a way, and there are certain principles and rules about what counts as a mitzvah and what doesn't count as a mitzvah. Fine. So that's a technical answer, but still I find it so unbelievable that of all the things, all the details, of everything that's discussed in Pasha's Truma, we say this is the Lysa, the one that says you shouldn't separate the poles from the ark. So from this you must say, it draws a great attention to itself, and there must be that it has great, great significance. And you have to ask yourself, what's significance? More than other things, even though everything has significance. So maybe you could say, first of all, some commentators say that the lesson over here is just like the general lesson that we say about Torah. Torah was given in the desert. One of the reasons is that it's given in a public property. Not a private property. So no one could claim it's theirs and no one else's. So we say the Torah was given in the Midbar, an open place, open range. Anyone and everyone could take it and has a stake in it and it's theirs. Moshe Kibbal Torah Mishina Yom Sodal Yeshua. Sorry. Torah Tzivulon Moshe Meirasha Kilis Yaakov. It's a Meirasha to the entire congregation. So to over here, the Torah had to have the poles attached to it to know that it doesn't belong to a single place. It doesn't only belong to the Kodesh HaKadoshim. It doesn't only belong to the Koyan or the Koyan Godel or to a realm of, of only those people that are deemed officially the holiest of holies. No. Even when the Torah is in the Kachik Kachim and has poles attached to it, which means that it's for everywhere. I he been saying even in the Midbar, there's no limits. There's no one that could say, it's only meant for me. Okay, that's one lesson. Another lesson, the Chinuch writes, the Sefer HaChinuch, and the Rebbe takes the Sefer HaChinuch, and this is what I want to talk about today primarily, and he takes something that the Chinuch said, and he, you see how the Rebbe takes it and turns it in a different direction, and says, I made it a the Chinuch writes the reason why the poles had to be attached to the Oren even when it was in the Kochi Kochim is because what happens if we have to move the Oren quickly and then we first have to attach the poles so there might be a mishap, it won't be attached solid and then we're going to carry out the Oren, the Oren might fall. Something might happen. And I'll read you now what the Chinuch writes. This is in Lukut Sikhis, page Tez, uh, Omid Chel, Tezayin, Omid 334. And he says, We're going to have to go somewhere very quickly in haste. And and therefore, the iron might fall. Who knows what can happen? So if you look at the Chinuch, simple meaning, what the Chinuch is saying is about Kovad It's for the honor of Torah that the Badim have to be attached so it's like safe. Really safe. No matter what circumstances the Torah will be in, it's going to be safe and protected. 
because the poles protected it, it should never fall, etc. Comes along the Rebbe and adds a twist when he interprets it in a personal level, as usual, Chassidus talks about something in Avedi Pinimius. What does Arn mean? Arn means a Yid that learns Torah. And what does it mean when you learn Torah? You're totally immersed in it. You're focused. You're concentrated. You're blotting out everything else. You're in Kochi Kochi. No one's allowed to go there. You're totally immersed, totally concentrated and focused. In a realm of holiness and learning. So somebody might think, Right now, while I'm immersed in a prima godim, in a ktsos, in a tesis, or an ayin beis, or in zayar, I should be thinking about another Jew. Right now, I'm learning for myself on my own level, and I'm getting my soul recharged. I'm in Kachi Kachim with Taita. Here comes along the Rebbe and says, No! Even while you're involved in the deepest, deepest spiritual realm of the holiest of holies learning Taita, you have to have poles attached because you might have to move to save another Jew. If you're a person that learns Taita, you're on call 24 7 to bring that Taita for someone else. To where it's needed. Now, now, now. And this, I'm going to read you the words of the Rebbe in the Sikha. I feel the when the Aaron gives in Sikha in Kachi Kachi, me when the Aaron is in Kachi Kachi, the Mark of Machim Mugdish Ba'ilam, the holiest place in the world, even there the poles have to be constantly ready. So you should be able to move it quickly. And the same thing is true concerning Taylor. How much a person is immersed in his learning. That for Alamol Zain Mochin, he has to always be prepared. If to bring in Torah, then Norm Vun Norm is all the Dafin. Wherever and whenever it's needed. On Dafkin and Aifun for me, heroes. And quickly, emergency. To Nochidin or Nochidin. To more and more Jews. How amazing is it? How amazing is it? That this is the way the Torah teaches us a lesson of care and concern for the world, for others, for society, for another Yid. There's no concept of a person being so socially divorced and disengaged that he should completely, ever, totally separate himself from another. Even in Kachi Kachim, the iron has the bottom. And We'll finish with three stories, anecdotes that bring out this point. First, there's a story that I'm sure I said before. That's with the Tzemach Tzedek. And this is what it says in the Sikha of the Fidig Rebbe. That the Fidig Rebbe said, I heard from my father, in the name of his father, the Rebbe Marash, that the Rebbe Marash said about his father, the Tzemach Tzedek, as Oviv, Hoyt Krik Dushas HaTzemach Tzedek, the Reb Marash said that his father, the Tzemach Tzedek, Be'ei said, as I feel given in the Hechst, his manim, even when he was in his highest periods, which means most elevated. When in the Tifste in Yonim, <laughs> we can't imagine what this means, and in the deepest concepts, most profound, Sa'i Yichsidis, Sa'i Yichsidis, whether it was learning Yichsidis, or whether it was in the middle of a very deep, it's called response, answering some deep, Complex halachic issue. Lahosh of the Shail of Binyone Alocha. Fleck is it upstown? He would stop, stop his learning and whatever deepest, deepest thing he was involved in. Untrachten, and he would think, Vi to turn a Eden Mikseho Ila Matoiva. How to do a favor for another Yid somewhere at the other end of the world, so to speak. This is exactly what the Rebbe says is the era of the Oren having the poles attached to it 24-7 in the deepest of the deep of the highest of the high. Even there, we're thinking about the other. 
That's the Tzemach Tzedek. Then there's a story I heard about. I heard this from Rabbi Bukit, who was my Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Chaim Meir Bukit. He said the following story, that there was somebody who once came to the Rebbe. Uh, there's a lot of stories that start this way, or a couple. In any case, he said a story that somebody once came to the Rebbe in Yechidus, and he told the Rebbe, you know, I heard so much they speak about the Lubavitch of Bacharim, that they're so amazing, they're so special. Listen, I spent time in the Zal upstairs, and I looked around, and uh, they don't seem so special to me. <laughs> what makes them so special? So the Rebbe said, I'll tell you a simple answer. I'll give you an analogy. From a fire station, he said, you walk into a fire station. What do you see? You see the firemen playing cards. You see the firemen making jokes. They're joking around. They're laughing. They look like regular people. What's the difference between the firemen and everyone else? But wait till you see what happens when the alarm goes off. When the alarm goes off and you see the way they spring into action, unbelievably alert, unbelievably powerful, unbelievably trained. And now they're able to actually go into situations and circumstances that put their own lives in danger. And they're able to successfully rescue another person. Then you see what makes them firemen and plain civilians, common civilians are not firemen. Firemen are firemen. That's the Bacham of Lubavitch. That's the Bacham of Tem Chitmimim. Maybe when you walk into the Zal, they look like just regular Bacham of any other yeshiva. But when we come to situations, like in Russia, where there was decrees and there was challenges to Yiddishkeit, you'll see how the Bacham from Lubavitch will the ones who will be the saviors. They're going to be the heroes. And they're going to rescue the situation. Same idea. Which means... I'm just saying that the body of have to be on the Oren because you have to be ready 24-7 for whatever will happen. And finally, there's a Gemara, which the Rebbe spoke about this Gemara sometimes, but I find it's not spoken about enough. And it's such an amazing Gemara. And it's the Gemara that says about Reb And the Gemara says... That great with the actions of Reb And before that, it's a Gemara of Mtsia. And the Gemara talks, it starts off just the section that the Shlokish was uh, looking for the uh, Matsevis, the holy place of resting for certain other tzaddikim. And he was trying to find Reb place, and he couldn't find Reb place. So he culture daite, and he omar, he said, the Beirish I didn't analyze Tera like Rebchia, so why can't I find his place? Yotza Baskel Varmalei, a Baskel, a heavenly voice came out and said, Tera Kamaisai Pupalta. You take you take analyze Tera like him. But Tera Kamaisai, Lady Batsta. But you didn't spread the Tera, you didn't disseminate Tera like him. And then right after that, there's a famous Gemara where it says that Reb and Reb they were Chavrusas. And they would argue, you know, Pshat. So when they would get to like this deep argument, you know, you said like that, you said like that, that's your opinion, you know what it is. And they were like stuck. So Reb would say to Reb you think you could debate to me? No way. You know who I am? God forbid, if the Torah had forgotten from the Jewish people, I could restore it with my powers of analysis and intellectual acumen. He says if the Torah would be forgotten, he would return it to me pulpuli. Through his pulpulim, through his power, he was a super genius and creative Torah giant. He would teach it to everyone and make sure that it would, that it would stay around. So he says to the Hanina, you think you could debate with me? You can't compare yourself to me. You know why? Because what I would accomplish, the late me Israel. You said if the Torah would be forgotten, I could restore it. Guess what? I would make sure that the Torah would never be forgotten in the first place. And that's a greater thing. But how? 
How did he make sure the Torah wouldn't be forgotten in the first place? So then the Gemara says, I'm going to read your translation in English. Rabbi said, what did I do to this? To make sure the Torah should never be forgotten in the first place? I go and I sow flax seeds and twine nets with the flax. And then I hunt deer and feed their meat to orphans. Next, I prepare parchment from their hides, from the hunt from the deer. And I write the five books of the Torah on those five parchments. I go to a city and teach five children five the five books, one book per child. And then I teach six other children the Shisha Siddha Mishnah. And I say to them, until I return and come here, reach each other the Torah and teach each other the Mishnah. And this is how I act to ensure that the Torah will not be forgotten by the Jewish people. And that the Gemara says, How great are the deeds of Rebchia. So in other words, his way is the greater way. And G'daylim, when we say G'daylim, it means that it's incomparable. So this is fantastic. There's a long way to elaborate on the meaning of the Gemara over here. But on one simple level is that he really ensures the future. And why? Because he himself, it's not only about himself being so great to therefore he could restore it. It's about him empowering others in the first place that it should never be forgotten. So in Reb Hanine's language, what comes out is that he's great, he's a giant, and because he's a giant, have no fear, I'm here, and the male Torah is here, and if there'll be a terrible situation, I'll continue teaching, and then people will learn. But that's not the same approach as doing something immediately. Having a Torah with Badei Ha'aren. The point of Badei Ha'aren means you're always thinking with such a mindset about bringing it to others. That others should be empowered. And this is what Reb did. He himself sowed the seeds, and he slaughtered the deer, and he made the parchment, and he wrote the Torah. And then he went and taught it. And then he told them each to be teachers. So everything, every step of the way is about continuing the Torah and making sure it's Badi Aaron that will continue further and further. And he's always thinking like that. And therefore, there's no point of time where the Aaron is without the Badim. The Aaron without the Badim could be a Reb Hanina. Until there might be an emergency, then we'll attach the Badim. No! If you're thinking like Reb Chia, the bottom are there the whole time. Because you want to make sure that it continues. And this is the connection to Mitch Hashem. Next week we have Zion Adar, Yeme Ledes, and Yeme Lulav, Meishar Abenu. What is Meishar Abenu's greatest, 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 greatest greatness, his virtue? Meishar Abenu. That he's a teacher. And he understands this idea that the whole thing is to bring it to the next person empowerment that he should know. Like we had in Rashi last week. What's his job? To review it and to review it and to review it with his students until it becomes clear and it becomes theirs. That was the whole point. And this is the main lesson we should take from Zion Adar. That we should be like teachers of Torah. It's not about the level of learning Torah that we reach, but that we should all be like Rabbeinu, have patience to repeat it and give it over to others. And this is also, of course, everyone understands the regular person off the street, if you ask him what's the Rebbe's greatest accomplishment, Shluchem, Shlichos, same idea. We're going to send somebody to Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iceland, wherever it is. We're going to bring the Torah of Ahib and Seya to wherever and make sure that others will learn Torah and it should continue. And this is also the connection, obviously, the Chedesh Order, the Rebbe says, Adar is Aleph Dar. The month of Adar accomplishes this idea of Aleph, the Ebishta, in the Dar, in the Dira bringing down godliness into the physical world. And this is all the connection to everything we're talking about. The Mishkan, the Migdash, the Parsha, Badi Aaron, bringing out the Torah into the desert, into the physical world. 
And this is the lesson we take from Moshe Rabbeinu. David should help that each of us should make resolutions to be a teacher of others. And this will bring the day of Molar is there as Hashem. Ashaloy Lamdu Oidish Israel, Begula Mitzvah Shlemo, take from Yad Mamish, posting from my home, Bez Shemiz Barak, your man in Melbourne.